is a lecture given to the British Homeopathic Congress in London, June the 1st, 1961, uh, given by George Adams, who was a very significant student of Rudolf Steiner. He starts his lecture by, by saying that uh, my theme will be to discuss new ideas and discoveries which, among other things, should contribute to the long-desired scientific explanation of the effectiveness of high potencies in medicine. Let me remind you to begin with where the difficulty lies. Uh, for generations past, the effectiveness of high potencies has been a fact of experience for the physician and has been of untold benefit to countless patients. Also, in recent decades, in the work of uh, El Calisco and uh, Boyd and others, it has been experimentally established by biological reactions as well as by purely physical and chemical reactions. Nevertheless, it is very difficult to account for in the light of the prevailing scientific notions. Now, a chemist who, who surmises that a particular component is responsible for some physical effect or some physiological effect will attempt to concentrate it uh, by distillization or by crystallization. And his theory is confirmed if the effect increases. Thus, for example, Madame Curie, with great difficulty, was able to extract a few grams of radium from tons of pitchblende. So uh, we have the question, why is it in that whereas most of the chemists do their work in trying to concentrate, why is it in the preparation of homeopathic remedies, instead of concentrating, we dilute? Now, of course, I'm aware that potencies are not just merely dilutions. Remember what Hahnemann said? He said, dilution alone, say, when a grain of common salt is dissolved, that produces merest water. If you dilute a salt with a vast amount of water, the salt simply disappears. This never can make it into a medicine. Yet, by our methodology, by our well-prepared dynamizations, the medicinal virtue of common salt is revealed in a wondrous manner and is enhanced. End quotation from Hahnemann. And nevertheless, there's no denying that among other things, the potentizing process or the dynamizing process does dilute the substance and in so doing, bring forth its virtue. Let's quote Hahnemann again. The homeopathic dilution of medicaments brings about no reduction, but on the contrary, a true enhancement of their medicinal virtues. Thus, our dilutions represent a truly wonderful unveiling, actually, according to life, of the medicinal and healing spirit of the substance." End quotation. Now, uh, the common sense difficulty of understanding how this can actually be, this is reinforced by the prevailing molecular theories of matter. Now, according to the prevailing molecular theories of matter, the number of molecules in a gram molecule of any substance is of the order 10 to the 23. Now, the exact figure, variously known as Avogadro's number or Schmidt's number, has been found consistently by several methods. So, in terms of molecular theory, starting with a normal solution and with the normal technique of potent Potent, potentization, potentization, 
by the 23rd or de 24th decimal potency, only one single molecule would be left. And from then onward, it is ever more unlikely that even this will be there in the medicine bottle or ampoule bearing the name of the substance. Now, ways of escape from this theoretical dilemma have indeed been suggested by the more recent theories of physics. The 19th century conceived the molecules, or their constituent atoms, more or less naively as ultimate or self-contained pieces of matter. The atoms and subatomic particles, protons and electrons and so on, have become purely idea entities figuring in recondite mathematical equations. As you're aware, uh, the chemical affinities and the biological effect of substances are today explained in terms of these atoms and subatomic particles, protons, electrons, etc. But they actually have become purely ideal intent entities, ideated entities, which are sort of figured in all sorts of complex mathematical equations. When you think of that mysterious duality of particle and wave, the physicist who is philosophically inclined can uh, suggest with scientific reason that each single atom has a sphere of influence which is co-extensive with the entire universe. In spite of this, uh, this speculation, there is a definite apparent gulf between the experience of homeopathic medicine and the conventional scientific outlook. And we can get a perspective of this in uh, terms of a wider historical setting. The growth of physical science from the times of Galileo and Torricelli, Newton, Boyle and Huygens, Dalton, Lavoisier and Faraday, right down to the present day. It's a wonderful chapter in the intellectual and spiritual history of mankind. Hahnemann's long life 1755 to 1843. This life spans an important period in this development, a development which led from the celestial mechanics of the 18th century to the electromagnetic theories and the growing chemical discoveries of the 19th century. Hahnemann is still young when hydrogen and the composition of water are discovered. He is in his prime when Dalton enunciates the atomic theory. Cavendish in 1772 confirms the inverse square law in electrostatics. Ersted and Ohm make their discoveries on the electric current in the 1820s. Faraday's electromagnetic researches culminate in 1831. In 1828, Wöhler's synthesis of urea undermines the old vitalistic ideas of organic chemistry. Those vitalistic ideas of organic chemistry, which Hahnemann, himself a creative chemist, still entertained in common with his contemporaries. This vitalism, which Hahnemann believed in, actually can today be reborn on a clear and scientific basis. Hahnemann's vitalism underlies his use of the word dynamic and the noun dynamis, which he adopts or coins for himself. In the very beginning, Hahnemann's notion of the vital force prevailing in the living body was essentially spiritual. He attributes illnesses to immaterial, 
dynamic causes. And in his essay of 1801, he describes the medicinal effects of high dilutions as dynamic rather than as atomic. To get perspective, we have to remember that that clear distinction of energy and matter and the law of conservation of energy were not yet current in Hahnemann's day. The mechanical equivalent of heat was discovered by Meyer and Joule almost exactly at the time of his death, 1842 to 1845. Until then, heat, light, uh, and other energies, bioenergy, psychological as well as physical energy, even including animal magnetism, all these energies up to that point were still being thought of as tenuous, imponderable substances. The supposed substance of warmth was called caloric. Lavoisier in 1789 still included heat and light among the chemical elements. And Rumford's experiment was widely supposed to have released the caloric from the iron which was made hot by friction. Even in 1824, when Carnot, in his Puissance Motrice du Feu, in effect discovered the second law of thermodynamics, which was soon to become a cornerstone of physics, Carnot still interpreted it in terms of caloric. And perhaps this idea of imponderable essences in the light of present-day ideas is no longer quite so wide of the mark as might have seemed 60 years ago. This should at any rate be borne in mind when we read Hahnemann's expressions. When, for example, Hahnemann describes as fine stofflich, uh, delicately uh, substantial, or as virtual, or well-nigh spiritual, when he, when he describes the medicinal effects set free from the material during the rhythmic processes of dilution, trituration, and succession, when he describes these medicinal effects set free as feinstofflich, delicately substantial or well-known spiritual. So when we get into perspective the development of scientific ideas, you realize that the history of science is not just a unidirectional process which many textbooks might lead you to imagine. The real truth is that many streams run side by side, and the most essential discoveries, either experimental or theoretical, the most essential discoveries may lie unnoticed, for they lie unnoticed for decades, until a fresh aspect emerges to reveal their importance. Let's try to consider for a moment what it was that gave the orthodox scientific outline a uh, uh, scientific outlook, it, it, it's its great strength. Thus can account for the intolerance with which the claims of homeopath homeop homeopathy have often been met. The strength of the scientific, orthodox scientific outlook was the result of a combination of an instinctive materialism with the mathematical clarity of theories supported by experiments and observation. This instinctive materialism is a genuine element in the consciousness of Western man throughout the 17th to the 19th centuries. This is connected with the age of explanation, the age of exploration, the growth of natural history, the growth of artistic naturalism, and the dawn of industrialism. Yet this instinctive materialism is reinforced by another, a much more ideated factor, reinforced by the confidence born of the intellectual clarity and the probity of mathematical thinking. Too often we forget how many purely ideated elements, in other words, spiritual elements, are built into the resulting scientific system. Mathematics 
is an activity of pure thought. Certainly Isaac Newton, whom we may justly think of as the founder of modern physics, was in his own dominant interests. He was a philosopher, even a theologian. This is revealed, for example, in his correspondence with Henry Moore and the Cambridge Platonists. Over a century later, other Englishmen of philosophical and religious disposition, they brought a similar clarity of geometrical imagination and mathematical analysis into the rising science of electrical and magnetic forces. We refer, of course, to Faraday and Clark Maxwell. It is this mathematical element in physics which gives it strength and power. Power for technical uses, strength in its influence upon our whole mental outlook. However, there is an element of tragedy in this, for the resulting system becomes a rigid framework and it bars access to the more spiritual aspects of reality, of which, for example, the truths of homeopathic medicine are an example. Just remember, the spiritual power of geometrical and mathematical thinking, which has helped to reinforce the rigid framework, the same spiritual power of geometrical and mathematical thinking can also help in the much-needed release. Now, before 50 years ago, before the time of Einstein and Minkowski, the space in which the real events of the universe were supposed to be taking place was the space of Euclid, the geometry which we learned at school. The space which is measured in finite and rigid length, or in areas and volumes based upon the measurement of length. And this same type of space was considered to prevail down to the smallest dimension and up to the largest dimension, inward and outward. The same scale of length leads to the millimicrons of atomic science, up to the parsecs, up to the light years of astronomical speculation. The question as to what happens when a straight line is extended to the infinite, that was held to be perhaps a question of merely philosophical interest, but beyond the effective range of science to deal with. Space was conceived as a vast empty container, populated by point-centered bodies, sending their forces and radiation uh, to one another. In some regions, these point-centered bodies were more densely populated. In some regions, these point-centered bodies were less densely um, populated. It becomes a field of manifold potential forces, but the real sources of activity are point-centered bodies of a material nature, or at least quasi-material nature. And apart from these point-centered bodies, there would be emptiness, a mere nothingness. This is a fair description of space, both from the popular idea and also from the point of view of mathematical analysis. Something very important was happening in the period from the 17th to the 19th centuries. At the time, while physicists and astronomers were busily applying their problems, uh, by applying to their problems, by the, applying the ancient geometry of Euclid to their problems, modified by the newer analytical methods of Descartes, Leibniz and Newton, while this was going on, a new form of geometry was arising among the pure mathematicians. A new form of ge geometry, which while including the Euclidean among its other aspects, a new form of geometry, of geometry was arising which was far more comprehensive than the Euclidean, far more beautiful and far more profound. We refer to the, that school of geometry which is known variously as projective geometry. 
modern synthetic geometry or the geometry of position. 17th century, the truths of this uh, new synthetic geometry were beginning to be apprehended by the astronomer Kepler, also by the mystical philosopher Pascal, also by Pascal's teacher, Girard de Sagu, uh, a less known but a very important historical figure. However, it was in the early 19th century, about the last 20 years of Hahnemann's own life, that the new geometry really began to blossom forth. Once again, the pioneers were the French mathematicians, among them Poncelet, Gergon, and Michel Chazel. These were soon to be followed by a few brilliant thinkers in Switzerland, Germany, England, Italy, and other countries. Largely unnoticed, except among pure mathematicians, this new geometry grew into an ever wider insight. Today, this new geometry opens out new ways of understanding nature. Above all, new ways of understanding living nature and the more subtle, the more spiritual forces which the intuitive genius of Hahnemann was able to perceive. Like Euclidean geometry, projective geometry is not only a discipline of pure thought, resting securely on its own ideated premises or axioms, but like Euclid, geometry, projective geometry is also related to practical experience, though to begin with in a rather different direction. You have to remember that our experience of the spatial world, above all, is a visual experience, a sight experience, a tactile experience, a touch experience. However, there are indeed other and less conscious senses uh, to which our spatial awareness and our geometrical faculty are largely due to. These other less conscious spaces, these other and less conscious senses, senses more proprioceptive of our own spatial body, both in itself and its interaction with the world. We refer to such less conscious senses as a sense of movement and the sense of balance. However, in our outward consciousness, it is a sense of touch and the sense of sight which reinforce, reinforce and confirm geometrical reasoning and geometrical imagination. We have to remember that the geometry of Euclid relates above all to the sense of touch. Thence, uh, because of that, it, relates, it has its natural connection with a scientific outlook which takes its start from tangible material things. The inch, the foot, the yard, all have their derivation from our own physical body. We measure as we touch the earth foot by foot and step by step, or in the rhythmic act of measurement with a fingertip and the yardstick. By tactile experiences, we can confirm the constant distance between parallels and we can confirm the symmetry laws of a right angle. We even can prove the first theorem of Euclid by the imagined tactile experience of applying one triangle to another. However, our experience of space is also visual, and as such, this, experience, this visual experience of space is far more extensive, far more manifold and satisfying. We see things we can never touch either by a hand or a foot or a tool. Our vision reaches to the infinite horizon and to the stars. You have to recall that in the 15th to the 17th centuries, the beginnings of modern science also coincided with the increasingly naturalistic art of the Renaissance. Both modern science and naturalistic art were inspired by the same love of nature and the same wish to penetrate into the secrets of nature. However, in order to give an outwardly true picture of the scenes of landscape 
a true picture of the forms of men, of the works of men, artists such as Leonardo da Vinci and Dürer, Dürer, they studied the science of perspective vision. And from the practical and aesthetic applications of this science of perspective vision, this gave birth to a new purely geometrical discipline, namely projective geometry. Projective geometry therefore naturally deals not only with tangible and finite forms, but it deals with the infinite distance of space, represented as these are by the vanishing lines and the vanishing points of perspective. And so in the new geometry, the infinitely distant is treated realistically in a way which was foreign to the classical geometry of Euclid and the Greeks. A bold step was taken when there was added to the finite space distance elements, there was added the infinitely distant elements, uh, referred to as the ideated elements of space. And this was a bold step in thought. This bold step in thought was rewarded by a twofold insight, which was most important for the understanding of the science of living things. In the first place, attention was focused no longer on rigid forms, such as the square or the circle, but attention was focused on mobile types of form, mobile types of form, changing into one another in the diverse aspects of perspective, or in other kinds of geometrical transformation. In Euclid, in Euclid for, for instance, we take our start from the rigid form of the circle, sharply distinguished from the ellipse, and the ellipse is sharply distinguished from the parabola, and the parabola is sharply distinguished from the hyperbola. Now, in projective geometry, it is the conic section in general of which the pure idea arises in the mind and of which various constructions are envisaged. Now, as in real life, the circular opening of a lampshade will appear in many forms of ellipse while you move about a room. The opening of a bicycle lamp projects onto the road in front in sundry hyperbolic forms. In a similar way, in pure thought, we can follow the transformations from one form of conic section to another form of conic section. Now, strictly speaking, the conic section of projective geometry is neither a circle, nor an ellipse, nor a parabola, nor a hyperbola. The conic section of projective geometry is a purely ideal form out of which all these arise, out of which uh, the conic section of the projective geometry is the purely ideated form, out of which the circle, ellipse, parabola and hyperbola, hyperbola can arise. As much as in Goethe's botany, the archetypal leaf is not identical with any particular variety or metamorphosis of leaf, but underlies all these metamorphoses. From this we can see that the new geometry produces a quality of spatial thinking which is similar to that of the metamorphoses of living form. This is the first important insight. But the second insight is perhaps even more important. Projective geometry recognizes as the deepest law of spatial structure it recognizes an underlying polarity, which, uh, to begin with, in simple and imaginative language, can be called a polarity of expansion and contraction. And, and this being used in a qualitative and very mobile sense. 
Just ask you to think of a sphere, not the internal volume of the sphere, but think of the pure form of the surface of a sphere. One sphere can differ from another sphere only as to its size. Apart from that, the form is the same. Now, the expansion and the contraction of a sphere can lead to two ultimate limits. When the sphere is expanded to the uttermost, it becomes a plane. When a sphere is contracted to the uttermost, the sphere turns into a point. A large spher spherical surface is less intensively curved than a small one. It's flatter than a small s spherical surface. And as long as it can still grow flatter and flatter, a sphere has not yet expanded to the utmost limit. And the utmost limit can be only the absolute flatness of a plane. We have a simple experiment carried out in thought. The ultimate contraction of a sphere and the ultimate expansion of a sphere. And this simple experiment in thought can lead us into the right direction. The expansion of a sphere leads to a plane. The contraction of the surface of the sphere leads to a point. Point and plane prove to be the basic entities of three-dimensional space, which is the space of our universe and of our human imagination. Speaking qualitatively, the point is the quintessence of contraction. The, spain, the, the, the plane is the quintessence of expansion. So from the point of view of the new geometry, three-dimensional space can equally well be formed from the plane inward, or you can form the uh, three-dimensional space from the point outward. One approach is no more basic than the other. Now, in the old-fashioned explanation, we start from the point as an entity of null, of null dimension, no dimension. Moving the point, say, from the left to the right, we obtain the straight line as the first dimension. Moving the straight line forward and backward, we get the two dimensions of, of the plane. And finally, moving the plane upward and downward, we get the full three dimensions. Now, for modern geometry, this way of thinking is still valid, but it is recognized as being only half the truth. It is one of two polar opposite aspects. And the real essence of spatial structure is the interweaving harmony of these two polar opposite aspects. Whereas in the orthodox system, we start from the point and move to the full three dimensions. In the other complementary aspect, we should start from the plane and then work inward. We can mention the first step. Just as the movement of a point into a second point evokes the straight line that joins the two, so does the movement of one plane into a second plane give rise to the straight line in which the two planes interpenetrate. We can continue moving in the same line and obtain a whole sheaf of planes, like the leaves of an open book, or like a door swinging on its hinges. And so you obtain a line of planes, just as in the former instance you get a line of points. So in the space-creating polarity of point and plane, the straight line plays an intermediate role, equally balanced in either direction. Just as two points of space always determine the unique straight line which joins them, so do two planes. All we need to do is to recognize that parallel planes too have a straight line in common, namely the infinitely distant line of 
either plane. All the intuitively given relationship of point, lines and planes have this dual aspect, this polar aspect. Whatever is found to be true of planes in relationship to lines and points is equally true of points in relationship to lines and planes. For example, three points which are not in one line, they determine a single plane. Now three planes not in line determine a single point. For example, the ceiling and two adjoining walls of a room. All spatial forms are ultimately composed of points, lines and planes. Even a plastic surface or a curve in space consists of an infinite and continuous sequence, not only of points, but of tangent lines and tangent or osculating planes. The mutual balance of these aspects, namely point-wise and planar, with a line-wise aspect intermedi intermediating, the mutual aspect of the mutual balance of these aspects gives us a deeper insight into the essence of plasticity than the old-fashioned one-sided point-wise treatment. The result of this is this, that whatever geometrical form or law we can conceive, there will always be a sister form, a sister law equally valid in which the roles of point and plane are interchanged. For example, in the case of a tetrahedron, with its equal number of points and planes, that form of the tetrahedron proves to be its own sister form, arising in an ideated way out of, its out of itself by the polar interchange of point and plane. So we can state, whatever geometrical form or law we can conceive, there always will be a sister form, a sister law, equally valid, in which the roles of point and plane are interchanged. And this principle is a master key among the truths of projective geometry. It can be known as the principle of duality, or, or the principle of polarity. And this principle of polarity in its cosmic aspect is one of the essential keys to the manifold polarities of the world of nature. And when you recognize that, you can lead to a form of scientific thinking which can transcend one-sided atomism and can transcend the materialistic bias. For example, if you place a sphere inside a cube which is just large enough con to contain it, touching the six planes of the cube, the sphere picks out six points of contact. Joined three by three, you get eight planes which form the double pyramid of the octahedron. And so octahedron and cube are sister forms in polar relationship to one another. The structure and number relationships are the same, only with plane and point interchanged. The octahedron has eight planes, each of them bearing a triangle or a triad of points and of the lines that join them. So has the cube, eight points, each of them bearing a triad of planes and lines. Dr. Hedron, on the other hand, has six points or apices, each with a fourfold structure, answering to the cube with its six four square planes. The number of straight lines or edges is the same in each, namely 12. Now the sphere is one of many spatial forms which can evoke the polarity of plane and point, which, speaking qualitatively, expansion and contraction. Now, that which is infinitely distant when taken as a whole in all directions, as it were, the infinite sphere of space, this is of infinite radius, 
and so is no longer a sphere at all in the ordinary sense, it is a plane. Just as a sphere contracted to a point is no longer a true sphere. We thus arrive at another of the basic concepts of the new geometry, namely the single infinitely distant plane qua infinite periphery of space. It is the presence of this unique plane which from the indeterminate and ever mobile forms of pure projective space helps to produce the more rigidly determined space of the physical world. In other words, the space of Euclid. We need think only of parallelism. Parallel lines and planes are those that meet at an infinite distance. Now, as the crystals in the world of nature and in the human works of architecture show, parallelism plays an essential part in all the laws and measures of the physically spatial world. To the laws of parallelism must be added those of the right angle and of angular measure. These two are determined from the infinite periphery inward. This fact is evident, for we bear witness to it in every act of mensuration, when we take our sightings from the most distant points available, or to be exact, from infinitely distant points. So for well over a hundred years, these ideas have been known to pure mathematicians. The fundamentally planar structure of universal space, not only point-wise, and the mutually balanced relationship of contractive and expansive qualities, or centric and peripheral qualities. These ideas, which have been known to pure mathematicians for over a hundred years, should at long last be taken seriously in our understanding of real nature. The example is the seed, the stem, and the leaf of the plant. These suggest two ways of studying the three-dimensional shape. One way is point-wise from the microscopic aspect, and the other way is plane-wise. Surely it is not unreasonable to suppose that nature is built on the same principles which light up in the mind of man when man exercises one of the noblest of human faculties, that of clear geometric thinking and imagination. Now, having dealt with the world of pure form, let us turn to the world of active forces. Since the time of Newton, Faraday and Clark Maxwell, clear geometrical and mathematical thinking has enabled us to master the play of such physical forces as the force of gravitation, the momentum of heavy bodies, the electrical and the magnetic forces. Now, unlike that of velocities or accelerations, the parallelogram of forces cannot be proved by any reasoning or definition. The parallelogram of forces is a fact of experience confirmed as accurately as we like by many kinds of experiments. Though we know of them only empirically to begin with, nature reveals that in their interplay and balance the physical forces obey mathematical laws. When we discover these laws and bring our mind into harmony with them, we learn to understand and master the play of forces. The result is all the power of our applied science and technology. Now, it is characteristic of nearly all the forces known to physics that these forces are point-centered. These are the kinds of forces which emanate from heavy matter. It's only natural that we have found them first, since physical science took its start from mechanics from the investigation of the cruder properties of matter. However, this was also due to the prevailing forms of thought. 
Through his Euclidean schooling, the spatial thinking of a scientist has hitherto been one-sidedly centric and point-wise. And so he has the mental equipment for understanding the centric forces. And so it's no wonder if he finds them. However, the forces of nature manifesting in the world of space and time are not only centric, there exist also peripheral forces. Even as the pure form of space is in the light of modern geometry balanced between point and plane, so are the forces that prevail in nature. They are not only point-wise or centric, but also they are peripheral or planar. In the domain of centric forces, the central point of the material planet on the Earth in which we live, in other words, the center of gravity of the Earth, is for us a center of primary importance. In the domain of centric forces, the center of gravity of the Earth is the center of primary importance for us. So, in the realm of peripheral or planar forces, what we experience as the infinitely distant plane is a most important source of the peripheral forces. In simple language, what we experience as the vast periphery of the blue sky in the realm of peripheral or planar forces, that is the most important source of these peripheral forces. Now, I shall endeavor to explain that this is an ideal key, an ideated key to what you are really doing when you enhance the power of your medicaments by the rhythmic process of expansion or dilution. But let me first point out that the idea of peripheral forces is not altogether new. Under the name of ethereal forces, or by other kindred forms of, forms of description, they've been known since time immemorial. In the East, their reality has never ceased to be recognized. They only need to be rediscovered in terms of modern science. Now the new geometry, which has grown to maturity during the 19th century, gives us the possibility of understanding the ethereal, qua peripheral forces in a strictly scientific sense. These etheric forces are related above all to the realm of life, just as the centric forces, the gravitational, electromagnetic, etc., manifest most strongly in the sphere of inorganic matter. Rudolf Stein, in his fundamental work entitled Fundamentals of Therapy, he described the ethereal formative forces of human and living organisms. He described them in their essence as being peripheral forces. Rudolf Steiner distinguishes between forces manifesting above all in the lifeless realm which emanate from material centers. He distinguishes those from another kind of force working not outward from any earthly center but working inward from the periphery, generally from the surrounding cosmos describes them as forces which do not possess a center, but forces which have a periphery. The, these forces tend towards the material bodies of living things. Above all, they tend towards the germinating centers of fresh life. This relative center towards which they work is not their source, but rather it is their receiver. We have to invert our accustomed functional ideas of center and periphery to get the right notion. A physical force emanating from a center needs the surrounding space in which to ray out. The infinite periphery has to be there to receive it. Likewise, an ethereal or peripheral force 
needs the living center towards which it works. It springs from the periphery, from the vast expense, vast expanse, and tends towards the living center. Just as a physical force springs from a center, from a plane of concentration, and works outward. Now in lectures to scientists towards the end of his life, Rudolf Steiner himself referred to projective geometry as a valuable pathway along which such ideas could be elaborated. Now if there were only rigid and finished forms, then the old Euclidean geometry might be sufficient for us. But to understand the genesis and the metamorphosis of living forms, we need a more mobile thinking. We need a thinking that reveals the balance between the centric and the peripheral, between the architectural aspect and the plastic aspect. Yet even the most rigid of nature's forms, that of the crystal, this is understood in a far deeper way when we perceive how the crystal lattice derives from an archetypal pattern in the infinitely distant plane, the infinite periphery of universal space. Now in the realm of living form, when once the new geometrical idea has been awakened in the mind, then morphology and embryology confirm what is known to us by simple everyday experience from the world of the plants, namely, how life on earth is sustained by forces flowing inward from the surrounding heavens. Up to now, biology has been trying to understand these things with concepts derived from the inorganic world, where centric forces predominate. It has been a hindrance to biological thinking to have to borrow its basic concepts from the non-biological sciences of physics and physical chemistry. Ideas no less scientifically exact should be derivable directly from the study of living phenomena, just as the ideas of mechanics and electromagnetics have been derived from the study of non-living things. To an open-minded contemplation, nature reveals on every hand the forms and the signature of active forces. Nature reveals not only centric forces, but peripheral planar forces. Once this is recognized, then the enhancement of medicinal virtues by the potentizing process becomes as intelligible. Now there's a passage in the Organon where Hahnemann distinguishes between the raw state of matter and what becomes of matter by ever higher dynamization when at long last it is entirely sublimed or subtilized into its spirit-like medicinal virtue. It is most probable that in the dynamizing process the matter is in the end entirely resolved into its individual spirit-like essence, and that in its crude condition it should in any case be regarded as consisting of this spirit-like essence in a latent, undeveloped state. End quotation from Hahnemann's Organon. Now, Hahnemann uses the word Wesen, which is translated here as essence. One is reminded that in former times, the most volatile and fragrant effusions of a living plant were taken to be physical manifestation of the ethereal forces and virtues. Hence, the traditional names would still survive. In English, we call them essential oils, and the equivalent in German is etherische Öle, i.e. ethereal oils. So we approach near to Hahnemann's meaning when we realize that the ethereal, the peripheral forces of life, working in towards the earth from the surrounding heavens, these peripheral, ethereal forces of life are the means of bringing into the physical world the purely spiritual essences to which 
the specific virtues of living things are due. This too is the significance of Hanuman's often repeated phrase, well nigh spiritual. Let's pursue the thought a little further. If cruder matter alone were concerned, if stress were laid on the domain of centric forces expressed in material quantity and weight, then it would be natural to expect that an effect conferably comparatively feeble in dilute solution would be enhanced with increasing concentration. We reduce the volume, in other words, we draw in towards the center. But if the substance is the bearer of ethereal virtues, of which the origin is peripheral, experience will show that the effect will be enhanced not by concentration, but by expansion. Now, admittedly, this notion is too simple because it actually is the rhythmic sequence of dilutions and succussions or triturations which render the potency effective. However, this too is understandable in terms of centric and peripheral, physical and ethereal spaces. Again and again, in physics, we see the rhythmic phenomena taking place along and about a line stretched between two endpoints, a violin string, a monochord, or even an organ pipe, or again between the poles of a Wimshurst machine. It is well known that the spark is not a simple discharge, but the spark is a rhythmically alternating discharge. Tension between two poles begets a play of forces giving rise to rhythm. But in these purely physical examples, either pole is of a point-like centric nature. I believe science will presently discover a deeper and more primary source of rhythmic activity in concentric spheres. No longer between two point centers or two ends of a line, but between center and periphery, between point and plane, in concentric spheres of which there may be many forms. The tension is no longer between two foci of like kind, competing with one another as in a tug of war, but between entities which are polar opposite in nature, physical and ethereal. I would suggest that a polarity of this kind is latent in every chemical substance, and that there's no physical material that has not ultimately arisen from the interplay of centric and peripheral forces, from the interplay of forces of earthly origin and forces of cosmic origin. The finished substance, lying there in its crude and quiescent state, is the ultimate precipitation of an activity between center and periphery. Qualitative speaking, between earth and heaven. I think the number relationships of valency and chemical constitution, also the wonderful rhythms of the spectral lines, will prove to be an expression of this fact. The words of the poet when he says, out of the everywhere into the here, apply not only to the human child, but to all living things, and applies in its ultimate origin to the very substance of the earth. Even the simplest facts of science point in this direction, although one will see this only if one's idea of space derives from the new geometry. Just think of a body which radiates light and heat. Think, say, of a candle flame or a glowing ember. Purely as a phenomenon, 
the radiation expresses itself in concentric spheres about the source. This is a fact of everyday experience, and it can be confirmed by exact experiment. Now, in the one-sided thought forms of the old geometry in physics, the whole activity is attributed to the visible point-centered source of the radiation with the surrounding space a mere emptiness in which it spends itself as it falls off with the increasing distance. However, in the light of modern geometry, the figure of concentric spheres has a meaning only as a mutual relationship between the center and the infinite periphery. The center is the answering point or the pole of the infinitely distant plane. And spheres are concentric if this point is the same for all the spheres. It is only by virtue of their common relationship to the cosmic periphery that the spheres are concentric. Thus, in the simple phenomenon of radiation, nature is bearing witness to the fact that in some way the periphery is an active partner. Incidentally, something like this appears to, be, to have been known in earlier times. And perhaps uh, this something is only waiting to be re-established in a more scientific form. I spoke of Newton's relationship to the Cambridge Platonists. Now, there was another of Newton's contemporaries who also moved in these circles of the Cambridge Platonists. And his name was Thomas Vaughan. He was a brother of the better-known poet Henry Vaughan. Now, like Newton himself, Vaughan was an alchemist, and he wrote books which are not easy for us today to understand. In his Lumine de Lumine, he tells of a spiritual fire earth, by which he evidently means something of the quality of a circumference, a cosmic periphery enveloping the earth. And, and Vaughan says, he who attains to the great secret will come to know how the fire spirit hath its root in the spiritual fire earth and receives from it a secret influx. Nay more, he will know while all influx of fire descends against the nature of fire, descends coming downwards from heaven and by the same fire having found a body, ascends again towards heaven and grows upwards. End quotation. Now, such paradoxical ideas are just as the ideas which are suggested to us by the clear and cogent thought forms of the new geometry. But here they seem to be expressed as the result of the immediate outcome of a mystical communion with nature. Admittedly, the thought I've put to you concerning radiation, to begin with, is purely geometrical. Nature alone can show whether and how it is relevant to the real player forces. Yet, in the light of your own experiences, this is precisely the suggestion which I now venture to put forward. In homeopathic remedies, insofar as rhythmic potentization plays an essential part in their preparation, you are already dealing with a realm to which this kind of thought applies. The substance you are potentizing was originally formed from the cosmic periphery inward by an individually rhythmic, not to say musical relation, by an individually rhythmic relation between the cosmic periphery and the earthly center. True, it has come to rest in the earthly place where it abides, in root or leaf of plant, in metal or crystal mineral, or even in the bottle on the apothecary shelves. But this only is its last resting place. In the precise 
earthly locality where it was first precipitated. It came into being through a specific individual relationship between the earth planet and the vast spheres of the cosmos. Now in this relationship lies the secret of its chemical individuality, a qua substance, and also of its vital nature if still embedded in the living realm. The formative rhythm is still latent in it, and when the careful hand of the pharmacist, guided by experience and inspired by the will to help, subjects it to the rhythmic process of expansion, mingling it by trituration with the spatial medium which is to receive it, an opportunity is given for the formative rhythm of its origin to be reborn. An opportunity is given for its latent connection with the healing essences of the cosmos to be restored. One is reminded of the saying of Navalis, and we quote, Every disease is a musical problem, and every cure a musical resolution. Moreover, is not the picture I have been given, the picture I am presenting now, is not this picture in harmony with Hahnemann's own words quoted above, when he speaks of the spirit-like individuality of the substance which in the crude material lies latent and concealed. Now, if I'm right in the main thesis I've put before you, a new chapter will be opened out, tending to bring our science nearer to life, nearer above all to human life. Now, work in the new direction is progressing, both in its biological aspects and in its bearing on the facts of chemistry and physics. When we refer to the book, The Living Plant and the Science of Physical and Ethereal Spaces, also the book, The Plant Between Sun and Earth, by George Adams and Olive Witcher, and then the book Deep Flanza in Raum and Gegenraum, means plant in space and counterspace, Stuttgart 1960, George Adams, another book Universal Kräfte in der Mechanik, Universal Forces in, in Mechanics, in the Mathematician, Mathematisch Physikalisch Correspondence, edited by Dr. George Unger. Now the concept of ethereal space as the natural field of action of living formative forces, which I've put forward all too briefly in this lecture, can be worked out with all mathematical precision. And as so often happens, when an idea is really fertile, in doing this one finds that one is not alone, that what is seemingly new has been divined and adumbrated and was implicit in much of the scientific work that has gone before. The seemingly unsurmountable division between an orthodox scientific outlook and the realms of human skill and experience which find no place in the accepted system of today. This seeming un unsurmountable, unsurmountable division is overcome without injustice to either party when a fresh aspect springs into focus. This, I believe, is about to happen, and in your profession, too, will find new life and vindication. And here ends uh, this remarkably significant lecture. And perhaps I ought to add some of the references which might help to understand this lecture. First, we have Lily Kalisko's book, Physiologische and Physikalische Nachweis der Wirksamkeit kleinsten Entitäten. The Physiological and Physical Proof of the Effectiveness of Small Entities. Also in uh, her book, Agriculture of Tomorrow. Then there's the uh, um, article in the British Homeopathic Journal, volume 44, 1954, entitled Biochemical and Biological Evidence of the Activity of High Potencies, 
by W. E. Boyd. Then you have uh, Geschichte der Homeopathy, the history of homeopathy, by R. Tischner, T I S C H N E R. Then you have Grundlagen der Potenzforschung, the basis of the investigation of potentizing, by Theodor Schwenk. Then you have Rhythmische Prozesse, Rhythmical Process, by A. Leroy. Then you have George Adams' uh, in, uh, presentation called Physical and Ethereal Spaces. Another uh, presentation called Space and Counterspace. Then you have the work of Louis Locher Ernst, L-O-C-H dash E-R-N-S-T, entitled Raum and Gegenraum, Space and Counterspace. Then you have uh, Adam's uh, uh, work entitled Space and the Light of Creation. These will help to get an idea of the new physics in such a way that one be able to proceed into the remarkable work of Rudolf Steiner and Hahnemann in the realm of etheric forces. This receives its first basic foundation in the transmutation of human thinking by acquiring new thought forms when exposed to the new projective geometry, the new synthetic geometry. Rudolf Steiner once mentioned that if one were to immerse oneself in this new projective, new synthetic geometry, then one could get an expansion of spiritual perception. An actual new type of clairvoyance could arise solely from immersing oneself in these thought forms. It's very important that those people who are associated with homeopathic medicine and are familiar with their actual practical application and validity. Yet those people, if they were to immerse themselves in these new thought forms, then these people would be able to discover that in their diagnosis they will be able to get new spiritual clairvoyance, which is most helpful in general medical healing. Here ends the tape.